But um, in the meantime, whoops, um, we're here tonight to talk about rocks. I am so happy that Sarah West is with us tonight. Sarah is a great friend and neighbor of the Schuylkill Center for Environmental Education. She's a retired science teacher and a trail ambassador with Friends of the Wissahickon. She's been lecturing, writing, and leading walks on Wissahickon geology for many years. Sarah, so happy you're doing this with us. Thank you, Sarah. Well, my computer is also interacting. Yep. So Sarah, you'll have to unmute yourself. There you are. All right, there we are. Great. And then I'll stop sharing my screen so you can start sharing yours. All right. But Sarah, thank you so much for thank you. I'm so glad you're here. Well, thank you for the kind introduction. And so we'll see if we can get this out of the way. All right. All right. Are we ready to start? You are, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Okay, well, thank you. It's nice to, to see people here tonight. And some of you I know and have seen some familiar names on the participants list. But this is a, a program that I've developed on uh, Wissahickon rocks, which are amazingly beautiful. And we'll have a chance to see that tonight. And rocks are like a history book. They're not written in English, but they're written in their own language. And we'll explore some of those things in the next 40 minutes. So let's see if we can, okay. Um, there are a number of sources of information that I used for uh, putting this program together. And I can show that again later if we wanna see it. But I thought I'd get you in, just orient you to as to where we are. We're on the, um, just east of the Appalachian Mountains and we're on a section that's called the Piedmont Uplands. If we look at this uh, diagram of, of the uh, geographic zones in East Southeast Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania is, our Philadelphia is right down in this corner uh, at the, about at the art museum, there's a, there's a fall line. And that's where the Piedmont Plateau, Uplands Plateau starts and more towards center city is on the coastal plain. Uh, which is really outwashed from, from the Appalachian Mountains as they've worn down. You can see we're really quite a lot, a long distance from the Appalachians. And at one time, the Wissahickon Formation was considered part of the Appalachians, but it's really far older. Uh, this is a diagram that one of my colleagues made. Um, the Wissahickon is 22 miles long in, in length. Uh, 15 miles of that is outside the, the city. It starts up in Ambler um, at Mo the Montgomery Mall and it travels through this red zone, which is a zone of, of Triassic shale. And then it goes through the Chester Valley, which is predominantly carbonate rocks. And it crosses a very important structure in our explanation of the Wissahickon, the Huntington Valley Fault which runs right, um, actually right through the northern tip of the Wissahickon uh, Park. And on that um, western side becomes the Rosemont Fault. And then the part we're gonna look at is in this green section called the Wissahickon Formation. And our little piece of the Wissahickon runs right down in here between the Huntington Valley Fault and the Schuylkill River. There are some very interesting ultramafic black rocks that form an arc that come up really from the Gettysburg area. And they are, I'll talk a little bit about them, but the one that I'm pointing to with this red pointer is right at the juncture of Forbidden Drive and, and um, um, Bells Mills Road. So the Wissahickon watershed is composed of all the land surface that drain into the Wissahickon Creek it's 64 square miles in area, and there are 12 different municipalities that contribute to it. And as I've said, here's the fault line right here that's gonna be important in one of our explanations. And south of that, the creek is 15 miles long. I thought it would be fun to take a quick trip through the Wissahickon. Um, the, the 
beginnings are really quite humble. The major source of the Wissahickon is a retention basin at Montgomery Mall. And you can see that is one of two. There's a smaller one in a place called Knapp's Woods in Montgomery Township. But the picture on the left here shows the humble beginnings, the major source. And the picture on the right uh, shows the mouth of the Wissahickon and where it empties into the Schuylkill River. There are a lot of small tributaries that enter to form a larger stream. And I want you to take a look at the land formation here. The banks are pretty low. The, the um, land is fairly flat, or we might call it gently rolling land. But these uh, tributaries gather together to form a larger stream. And the, the flow is pretty, pretty slow because there isn't much drop in this part of the stream. This is where you, it would be in Fort Washington Park. Um, and when the stream starts to drop, we're going to begin to see ripples in it. And again, this is uh, near Mather Mill in uh, along Bethlehem Pike. Uh, the Wissahickon flows through Morris Arboretum, and several branches flow past, uh, flow through, flow through the Arboretum. This is the branch that forms that flows by a building called the Springfield Mill. And you can see the drop is beginning to pick up and the uh, flow is beginning to increase. We're getting more ripples. So the, the creek passes through the Castaneda Hill College campus and then it makes a sharp right angle turn and it enters the Wissahickon Gorge, which is gonna be very different um, and if there's going to be a 108 foot drop between Chestnut Hill College and where the Wissahickon is there and, and, and its mouth. Now the picture on the left still is showing fairly low banks, but the one on the right is typical of the flow through the Wissahickon. And as I advance through these pictures, notice what happens to the uh, banks, how steep they become. It's going to flow underneath that beautiful covered bridge, which is a treasure to Philadelphia. And um, in some places it doesn't flow rapidly, but by some, you can see that the bank in this place is really quite high. And at some places there are really very large folds. This fold is, can, is visible from uh, Valley Green Bridge and it goes um, from the base, Let's see if I can bring that up, it goes right over at the top and you may not be able to see this, but the edge of the fold, the top of the fold and where it starts to go down is right there. So it's a fairly steep bank that we're having right by Valley Green. Uh, under the bridge, uh, the picture on the left was taken in 1985 and the one on the right in 2005. And you can see the water level is lower. When that Valley Green Bridge was made, it was made so that the reflection of the bridge in the water gave a perfect circle. And as the water level has fallen, that circle has become more oval. So why is it, right, right here, we don't see any gravel in here, but now we're seeing kind of gravel with a much lower water level. Why is it that that water level decreased? Well, in Hurricane Floyd in 1999, what happened was that the force of that water took about two feet off the dam at, at Livesey and uh, at Livesey Mansion. And let's take that picture is taken from the western side of the creek. And you can see that dam has been worn away. And that's what's lowered the water level. A lot of the dams have become lower or removed by floods and creeks are going to be healthier um, with fewer dams. Um, keep looking at the sides of the creek, the Walnut Lean Bridge, very steep under the Henry Avenue Bridge by Wissahickon Hall, which is one of the two remaining roadhouses. There were seven at different times in Wissahickon history. And eventually we get to the mouth of the Wissahickon with the Philadelphia Canoe Club shown on the left. And there were at one times mills on this corner. 
uh, this bridge that the pointer is indicating now is Ridge Avenue, and the high bridge is the Norristown Railroad line. Just south or just downstream from the mouth of the Wissahickon is the Queen Lane Station water intake, and it provides water to about 30% of Philadelphia. Um, the part in the map in orange is the part that is supplied. So if you live in this Northwest corner, Germantown, Mount Airy, Roxborough, Chestnut Hill, uh, you're getting your water from the Wissahickon treated well, but taken in from the Queen Lane pumping station. So we've seen this creek uh, start in gently rolling lands and end in a little mountainous gorge. But this is a very unusual form for a creek and, and it's gonna take a little bit to answer why. But most creeks will start in steep land and will flow into gently rolling land, then into flatter land and often into some kind of wetland before entering a larger body of water. And the gradient decreases as the creek pro progresses towards its mouth. So how can we explain these unusual features of the Wissahickon? The Wissahickon rocks are older than Appalachian rocks. The Wissahickon does not flow in the usual pattern. It originates in gently rolling land and ends in a steep gorge. And the Wissahickon enters a go the gorge after crossing a fault line. And this fault line, I'll just remind you, we saw in an earlier picture, but it's right here in red. And this part right here is the part in the, in the Wissahickon Gorge in Philadelphia. So we've changed from very steep land surrounding it from originally low to steep, just opposite from what the typical stream in a geology textbook is described. So we wanna figure out why that occurred. Well, the answer to almost all the questions that you can ask in geology is plate tectonics. And it's a unifying theory for geology and uh, became uh, widely accepted in the 1960s. It was resisted at first, but it does offer some very helpful explanations. And the version that I'm gonna show you is taken from a book called Written in Stone. Uh, I think our, our uh, toolbar at the front top is, is, I can't seem to remove it, is including that title, but it's called Written in Stone, A Geographical History of Northeastern United States by Chet Ramo and his daughter, G, uh, Maureen, and she was the one that was the geologist. And we start out looking at the earth as we would expect it to find it today with a familiar Atlantic and the continents on each side, and then a little cutaway that shows the interior that we'll come back to. But it wasn't always that way. Let's see, we can advance this. Here we are. And I think I skipped one here. Uh, there are lots of different versions of this kind of this this kind of uh, continental drift or plate tectonics. And I happen to like the one in Chet Ramos' book, Written in Stone, because it shows some interesting things that help us understand the Wissahickon. But you can find lots of versions of this that are slightly different. Um, they all have some things in common. And let's face it, nobody was here when it happened. So um, how are we to know? But at the beginning, way back in pre-Cambrian times, you can see at the bottom of this diagram, there is a little timeline and the highlighted portion is going to advance as we move through these diagrams. But most of the land masses in pre-Cambrian times are believed to have been below in the Southern hemisphere. And the part that's going to become North America, Laurentia, is lying astride the, uh, the equator. And the, most of the land mass actually exists around the Antarctic, around the poles. But if we move to the early Paleozoic, you can see there are some changes. Uh, Laurentia is rotating. 
uh, upwards. And there's a sign called that, that indicates the Ipidus Ocean right in here. Ipidus in, in mythology was the father of Atlantis. So this was the ocean before Atlantis. And uh, oceans open and close. We think they look like pretty permanent features. And in terms of our own life histories, they are, but they, they, they're, not, they're not constant. They grow and then they decrease. And the Ipidus Ocean is going to decrease. Now there's a little piece of land here with a green arrow on it, and it is labeled Avalonia. And I want you to watch and see what happens to this as we move through this. And would you mind if I admit this person to get that sign out of the way? Um, so the Ipidus Ocean is going to uh, decrease more. When oceans decrease, we get mountain ranges. There's something happening right along the boundary where the ocean crust is pushing below the continental crust and causing a big wrinkle. And that big wrinkle is gonna become quite huge when that Ipidus Ocean finally shuts and we get to a, a continent that is huge and we called it Pangea, um, all land. And right down the middle of that land was a massive mountain range, higher or at least as high, if not higher than the Himalayas. And that's what, that's what happens when oceans shut. Now, Pangea stayed together for a while, but not forever because then a rift zone developed in a, along where the suture was earlier. And we're gonna get a new ocean forming right in here, a rift zone. But you notice Avalonia doesn't appear in here. And that rift zone opened up and now we're finally <clears throat> getting to a, a formation that looks more familiar to what we have uh, with North America now significantly north of the equator and Africa and Europe and South America where we might expect to find them. And you can see in this diagram, there were some huge inland seas that covered much of the land. A lot of what's our Grand Canyon and other places were covered by a massive inland sea. But eventually we get back in the current era, to the familiar configuration that we have. Do those processes continue today? We'll see that they probably do. But what happened to Avalonia? Avalonia left stuck on the future North American continent. And we believe today that's what makes up much of New England and uh, Maine. And Cape Cod is, is a, um, res a result of, it's a, a moraine from the, the glaciers that retreated from there. Well, we think that the Wissahickon may have been another one of these terrains. The terrains are easily recognized on the West Coast because they're younger, but we can identify a number of them on the East Coast. This Avalonia, one called the Gander terrain, and that apparently stuck on at an earlier time. There are land formations that form in closing oceans. Now, if we want a model or an example of what might be happening, uh, what might have happened, we can see the same kind of thing occurring today. And in the Mediterranean, uh, there was a famous Scottish geologist, James Hutton, who lived in the 18th century, who was an absolutely marvelous observer. And what he said was, the, the present is the key to the past that the processes that we observe today going on were probably processes that formed our earth in earlier times. So the Mediterranean is a closing ocean. And so you would expect a, a, a mountain range. There is one right across here. It's called the Alps. It's got different names when it gets over, but eventually connects with the Himalayas. This whole African continent is pushing north underneath Europe and it's making these mountain shrines. But look what's out here. There's Cyprus, there's Crete, um, Sardinia, Corsica, the Balearic Islands. They're a volcanic structures, largely. And eventually they're going to become terrains. 
stuck on the European continent and they may remain stuck if that Mediterranean ever opens again. Um, Italy is already a huge terrain that is stuck and it's produced these Alps right at the top. We also have rift zones in our opening oceans and the Red Sea is an example of one and all of Eastern Africa is a rift zone. You can see in this part of the picture and eventually these pieces of land may come off and this may become a new ocean, maybe as large as the Indian Ocean. We don't know, but all those processes that I was trying to sell you on in those other pictures are also occurring today. And this picture just shows you the plates on the earth where all this kind of action is taking place. Uh, wherever you see those big arrows, the plate movement is pretty great. The green are kind of intermediate and yellow and the little black arrows are where the motion is pretty, pretty minimal. But the average amount of plate movement is about the same pace that our fingernails grow and uh, it differing in different parts of the earth. You can see Australia is really moving very quickly towards the north, but others are not moving as much. Will plate movement continue in the future? Well, yes. The top diagram is somebody's idea of what it's going to be like in 50 million years. The Mediterranean is gone. Um, Australia is now north of the equator. Uh, there are some other changes you might see. And then in 250 million years from now, we may have another Pangaea. It looks to me like the Atlantic has closed again and um, all the land masses have come together in one massive piece. I, I read an article that suggested that there have been two Pangaeas already before the current one. And uh, so this is, this is a process that's probably been occurring ever since the earth formed. So what makes it happen? Well, if we do a cutaway of the earth, we can see in the very center of the earth is the core. There's heat being produced there. Some of it coming from radioactive decay. And it's not even across the core. In some places it's hotter, there's more heat than others. So if, say this is a hotter region where my arrow is showing, there's gonna be an uplifting. The mantle's gonna be warmer and it's gonna rise. And as it rises, it may push up into the middle of an ocean and cause what we call a mid-Atlantic ridge or rift zone. At the top, it's cooler out here. If there's less heat coming from the core in, in this left-hand region, that uh, mantle may cool off and it may fall back towards the outer core. And when that happens, the oceanic crust, which is actually heavier than the continents, is gonna start to fall. So will the, the mantle underneath the continents, but the ocean crust is gonna push under the, the, the um, continental crust and we'll have another kind of closing zone or a converging zone. We'll just take a look at a little close-up view of a diverging or rift zone that the mantle is pushing up because it's hot, it breaks through and it pushes the continents apart. And Iceland actually, which is a volcanic island, is right on top of the mid-Atlantic zone. We'll get back to the Wissahickon sometime pretty soon. The other kind of zone, which is more important in explaining our Wissahickon rocks, are what's called a convergent plate boundary, a subduction zone. Now, when an ocean closes, there are often volcanic islands that form off the coast, and they, they're going to be the source of the, the terrains that get stuck on the coast but the ocean crust is pushing down underneath the continental crust. It's causing a great, great deal of heat and melting and the rise of magma. And if we have a big enough collision, such as land masses, continental masses that are colliding together, we can actually get quite a big zone right where the arrow is pointing. And that's where metam most metamorphic rocks are forged. 
And here's an enlargement of that. So metamorphism or change in rocks occurs at plate boundaries. And our rocks in the Wissahickon were forged in a converging subduction zone and where uh, rocks that at one time were sedimentary and even in parallel lines have now become folded and bent. So let's look at that in a slightly different way. Oh, these pieces that we see down here are melting uh, rock, often continental crust rock that's melting down and it's going to rise and push up. And sometimes it reaches the surface and causes a volcano, but often it just stays under the surface and cools off and, and we can uh, see it as a big granite batholith or like the top of a mountain. So let's take a look at how all these ideas get put together in something called the rock cycle. Go back. Um, if we start with sediments on rocks that get washed off the land like mud and sand, they're gonna collect in a, in a body of water that can be shallow or deep. And they're eventually gonna compact each other. And very often there are um, animals like mollusks or coral that live on this set, these sedimentary rocks and produce a, a kind of carbonate glue that makes the rocks stick together. So living organisms are part of this uh, process too. So if these sedimentary rock layers get caught up in a subduction zone or a converging zone, they can undergo metamorphosis. And here you see the parallel layers are now all crinkled up because there's been a big collision. If the heating goes on and these rocks get buried far enough, they'll melt back down and they'll come up as what's called igneous rock, magma that rises in the crust and may cool in the crust or, or can be a volcano. But if it cools, it'll just stay as a big batholith or pluton in the, in the crust. And we will become aware of them when the rock erodes away above. Now our Wissahickon rocks formed in this kind of a zone, but they have some of these um, igneous pieces in them that never, that never erupted as a volcano, but just stayed buried and got exposed when the overlying rock, 10 miles of it, if you can imagine that, wore away. So let's go back to the Wissahickon and use the explanation that we've been developing and apply it to the rocks that, that we can see in our Wissahickon uh, and in many other places and parts of the earth. But the Wissahickon rocks are mostly metamorphic or igneous rocks. There is one kind of sedimentary rock that I'll tell you about because there's a lot of it. But the major kind of rock is called schist. And that's what you see on the left-hand side. And, and it's layered rock and it formed from uh, mud deposits that became compacted into sedimentary shale. And then if that began to undergo slight metamorphosis, it became slate. And, but if it's buried and heated with enough pressure, it's going to become schist. It might once have had fossils in it, but the metamorphosis the burying and the heating and the pressure dis, uh, destroys those fossils. Uh, when, when I was a kid, uh, we used to be encouraged by our parents or grandparents to put a penny on the train track. And the train would come in and run over the penny. And after the train left, you would go look for the penny. And the penny would be flat and smooth. And any remnant of Abraham Lincoln's head which is a good representation of a fossil, was totally gone because that penny had been subjected to heat and pressure. And that to me is a helpful analogy of what's happened to these rocks. If you find a, a fossil in one of the real exposures in the Wissahickon, you might get fame and fortune. There's another kind of sediment of, of metamorphic rock called quartzite, and that's 
formed from sandstone. It's metamorphic sandstone. The real difference is that the sediments that formed it were not mud, they were coarser, they were sand. But the same kind of process. Pegmatite and granite we find in the Wissahickon, and I'll show you some pictures of the difference of that. They are igneous flows, and they might very well have flowed into the Wissahickon rock in those rising plutons or batholiths that we saw in the previous picture. And then there's a category of rock, not a particular kind, but a category called gneiss. The G is silent and it's very highly metamorphic rock. It's probably descended from schist, and, but it's tightly banded. So what we have here is schist. I'll have to show you a picture of quartzite later. This is pegmatite with pink feldspar in it and quartzite. And this is the uh, one of the kinds of gneiss. And you can see it's very finely banded black and white. And um, it is almost ready to have been melted down back into magma, but it wasn't. But here's quartzite. Quartzite is the sandstone, the metamorphic sandstone. And it's kind of nondescript. It's brownish. Sometimes it's light brown. Sometimes it's darker brown because of weathering on the outside. And it doesn't have layers in it. It tends to break into blocks. And there's huge amounts of it, huge layers of it that form often interlayered with schist. Here's the schist, three kinds of schist which are metamorphic shale. Their natural color is really quite lovely. It's a light tan, and sometimes it just sparkles with mica. And the top one shows you that it's split into layers, very fine layers that you can see in here. They're not like the layers you find in slate. They're not gonna come apart. But if, if we thought of this as an old book, and here's the cover, and down here's the bottom cover, and in between, the layers are like the pages of a book, all parallel to each other and stuck together. They're not going to come apart. This is, um, this is garnet schist. It looks kind of like a chocolate chip cookie, but the, the chocolate chips are garnets. And in the Wissahickon, the garnets are not gem quality, but they're garnets. They have other inclusions in them. So they're not that lovely red color that you get with the gem quality garnet. And this other diagram on the lower right shows you a, um, three quarters of a crystal of storolite, which is another silicate um, mineral gem, gem. And it twins, it forms two twins. And if I found the, the fourth quarter, it would have been in here looking a little bit like a four leaf clover. And it's also in a layer of schist. And you can again see the layers of the schist uh, and, that, and its natural color. Now, a lot of the schist you see in the Wissahickon is going to appear black because it's weathered on the outside. And um, sometimes there's a, a blue green alga, a black alga that grows on the outside of the surface of the rock. And sometimes it's oxidation or other chemical changes. But if a piece gets taken off, you can see that beautiful tan color underneath. And some of us have houses that had schist in them. Uh, and the, the, those, those houses often show mica, but very often a gray color because of the weathering. Okay, now here's the kind of sedimentary rock that's in the Wissahickon. It's not the kind that's formed from mud or sand or other particles. It's called chemical sedimentary rock. And it, it's um, there is a lot of it in the Wissahickon, and it's what's called vein quartz because it's made pretty much of pure quartz. There may be other inclusions in it. This milky white quartz I found in the Wissahickon, it was in a creek bed. There's sometimes it has a rusty color because it's got iron oxide in it. But this is the best piece of vein quartz I could take a picture of. And what, how it forms is, notice it's got layering in it that makes it look like schist. It formed in a crack in the schist 
when that schist was buried 10 miles or so underground, there's a lot of heat, there's a lot of pressure. And although quartz does not dissolve in water well at very high temperatures and pressures, it will be carried in dissolved form in water and it would fill those cracks. And then over time, it would solidify and leave a little cast of what the, the, um, the crack looked like in, the, uh, in, that, in that deeply buried schist. And I have another picture of vein quartz in, in situ and that I was with a friend and she's got her finger on some very large vein quartz that is in a schist exposure. Now that you can see the schist is all black because it's weathered, uh, but the schist is much softer rock and it eroded away, weathered away over time, leaving that vein quartz sticking out. Often the vein quartz breaks off and you find it in creeks and on the ground, but this is some vein quartz that is in, was a cast of some cracks in schist that are no longer there. So those, those are the major kinds. Now for the granite and the pegmatite, this upper left is granite. These two on the lower right and left are two forms of pegmatite, same composition. They're probably igneous rock, but this is granite that I, I have a picture of the granite that I borrowed from the granite quarry that's just, uh, it's just downstream from Northwestern Avenue, about a third of the way towards Bells Mills Road. And you can find it on some of the, uh, the field trips that, that are written on the Friends of the Wissahickon website. But it's very fine grained. It's um, uh, the white in it is feldspar. And then there's some gray in there that's probably quartz grains. And there are black specks that could be a variety of things, but often are a mineral called hornblende, or they could be biotite mica. Uh, it cooled relatively quickly in the course of its history, it or it didn't have very much water content, so that the minerals that made that magma did not have time to find each other. Uh, when magma um, forms, uh, an igneous rock, it doesn't really become a fluid. It becomes like, like that would run. It becomes a, a, of the consistency of what we might call putty, silly putty or um, therapy putty. Um, and if you take a ball of that stuff and you make a ball out of it, it we all would agree it would be solid and it, it would look like a ball. But if you put it down on the table, it would lose its shape and it would flow. And, but it always would be a solid. So this magma is a solid that flows and the minerals in it, the mineral molecules that are in it can move around in it and can regroup and find each other and bond together and form a crystal. And if, they, if there's enough space, the crystal will look like the textbooks tell it to. If there's not enough space, they'll just be uh, fully interlocking pieces of, of rock. Now the pegmatite has the same history, but it had more water content and, or it cooled more slowly and it stayed more in the semi-fluid state that let the minerals migrate towards each other and form crystals. So the crystals can get bigger. And this is a, a white fels, a felspar crystal um, and it's much bigger than, than what we find in the granite. There's a pink pegmatite down here in the lower corner and it has, um, it was a little weathered on that side, but it has pink crystals of, of um, it has pink feldspar crystals. It also has quartz in it, which is gray and it has black specks, which are on, often need to be identified especially, but these are three different kinds of igneous rock that we find in the Wissahickon. Remember also fused in a, in a um, subduction zone during the time that the oceans were closing. The Wissahickon rocks are older than those in 
in the, in the Appalachian Mountains. And what you're looking at are the roots of a very ancient mountain range or mountainous blob of land. Uh, and the part that made it look mountainous has all eroded away. And if you looked at other mountain roots, roots of other mountain ranges, I think you'd find the same kinds of rocks. All right, some very interesting rocks that um, we find in the Wissahickon are made of talc. And they're soft enough so you can actually scratch them with your fingernail. And they're called talc schist. And this is a, a rock. I'll show you a picture of where it came from. Uh, it's called anthophyllite schist, but it's very, very soft. And it's also fascinating because it's pushed up from great depths in the crust or maybe very outer parts of the mantle in these collision zones. And when it's deep underground, it's pretty stable. It's probably pretty hard. But when it gets pushed up to the surface where the pressure and temperature is less, it's softer rock, it erodes easily and you can scratch it with your fingernail. Uh, I mentioned the fact that there's some big talc boulders that you find at the conjunction of, of um, Bells Mills Road and Forbidden Drive. And they look black on the outside, big black uh, pieces. And they've pushed up from the inner crust and they actually have little blocks of magnetite in them. They're very high in iron and magnesium. And so they're uh, called ultramafic rocks. So I, I wanted to mention this because you can find them in a number of places in the Wissahickon. Uh, there was a soapstone quarry uh, very close to Bells Mills and Forbidden Drive, right the, near there, where you can find these really soft, scratchable rocks. So I guess your brain is getting full of rocks. <laughs> so we'll just do one more kind. It's called Nice, and it is finely banded rock. And it can be of different colors. And it can be made from any other kind of rock that's undergone the highest degree of metamorphism. It can be orange and gray, like the one you see on the left. And that's a picture of Baltimore nice that we have in the Wissahickon. And then the one on the right is also a Wissahickon nice. It's black and very finely banded with white white, black and white bands. You can, you can make nice out of granite, out of pink granite, and then it would be white and pink bands. Uh, so it's really a process, not a particular type of rock. And so let's look at the other half of this rock cycle that's affected our Wissahickon rocks. Um, and we, we're going to say plate tectonics is got two parts to it. The rock cycle is driven by plate tectonics and also by weathering. So I wanna talk a little bit about that because it's the other half of the story. Um, weathering occurs by wind, water, uh, ice. It can be um, any, any kind of um, erosion is, is, is considered weathering. This is a picture of Hurricane Floyd and the fellow that took it Cross the police barrier and went down to take the picture. But you can just see the power in that water. It can cause huge amounts of erosion, wearing away of the soil and, and really smoothing out the rocks that are under it. And this is a picture shortly after Hurricane Floyd, where Hurricane Floyd had picked up really very heavy hundred and some pound rocks and carried them well inland from the creek. and they all got cleaned up. They covered the paths. They got cleaned up by volunteers. Um, so that, that's the water can, mute, can move huge amounts of weight. We can also have biological weathering from mosses and lichens. And uh, you can see pictures of that. Uh, the one on the left shows trees whose seeds fell into cracks and fractures in the rock and have caused that rock to fracture and eventually break up can have chemical weathering where oxidation occurs that's similar to rusting or hydrolysis where water combines with the material in the rock and really softens it so it almost looks like it's going to become soil again 
So plate, the Wissahickon rocks resulted from plate tectonics on one hand and erosion on the other. And we're gonna just look at some exposures and see some different kinds of formations that show this, uh, this rock cycle. But we're gonna find tilting, folding, layering, igneous flows, and then fractures and faulting. And the picture that you have here shows a quartzite layer that's um, pretty much typical for quartz and it shows schist. And can you see that layering in the schist, that fine layering? That's very characteristic. So that's what tells you you have schist. But this is another quartzite layer on the bottom. And again, a thick layer of schist. This was sand, sand deposits at one time, mud on top of it. And it may have formed in a floodplain where at one time water was flowing quickly and only the large particles could settle. And at other times, eons later, the water was very still and the sand particles settled out somewhere else and we're getting mud to settle. This is a, a, a rock uh, with a colleague of mine that shows schist up above and then a huge flow of pegmatite. And it looks like it carried a little bit of quartzite with it but it was a big flow of pegmatite that flowed in between some other layers. And I think this is quartzite down here. It has a kind of blocky break and that sometimes indicates quartzite. There's a big pegmatite, pink pegmatite flow right in front of the McGargy Dam. And it sometimes is covered with mud and you can't really see that pink color in it well, but if you pour some water on it, you can see, see the pink come out. And it carried with it as it flowed, it carried some quartz with it, some quartzite with it. And um, I put a pencil there so you could see the relative sizes. Then most of the rock in the Wissahick is tilted one way or another. And I like this rock because it shows it's tilted down towards the Northeast in the Wissahick. But it also shows that the layers have separated in that rock. And when those layers separate, that's when things can flow into the middle. And that's when folding can occur. We've seen that before. Um, this is a picture of a calc rock, that anthophyllite sill that's actually tilted. You can see it tilted upward and it's bumped up out of the ground. And remember this happened 10 miles or so underground. We see it because of erosion. But here's the, here's my favorite rock. And some of my colleagues have called it Sarah's rock because I extolled its virtues for so many years. But it was at one time probably schist and the layers were separated. And in the course of the pressure and the heat, a pegmatite flowed into the cracks between those separated layers. And then the whole process got folded again. And it's, a, it's on one of the trails that we describe on a field trip. And you can see all kinds of finely banded nice in here. Uh, just a huge amount of metamorphism that, that went on. I can't imagine the power it takes to fold a rock, but there it was. And this is just a close up of what those bands look like as they flowed and metamorphosed the rock in, into nice. Sometimes you can find folds in rocks that you can actually put your hand over in the Wissahickon. And that's on the top part of this rock that we just finished looking at. And sometimes we find folds in rocks. Here's a quartzite fold right here. It probably started out by being a fold that kind of went vertical, but then a second period of, of, of continent, of metamorphism of continent move, plate movement occurred and that fold got moved over on its side. And it shows because the lighting on that rock was just right that day. There are other fractures or cracks that you can see in the rocks that occur when things get compressed from top to bottom. And here's another two more folds uh, that had, had to have huge pressure and heat. But here's one fold, it's kind of been pushed over on its side, it's quartzite and it's embedded in schist. And that schist looks um, gray because it's got a lichen growing on it. 
And here's another double quartzite fold right here. And then in this piece of rock, here's a piece of pegmatite that somehow followed a fracture and it crosses all these layers. And we know that this pegmatite is younger because it crosses all these layers and they had to be in place before that little pegmatite flow occurred. And can you see its texture looks rougher than, than the others? Um, again, these rocks are buried way, way below and we have some evidence that they were buried from a process called exfoliation. And this particular rock here, which is right next to a creek, up to the creek, um, it, its sheets are coming off. It's layering like uh, the, the layers of an onion, just lifting right off of the core of that rock. And that's because at one time, the weight on that rock was so heavy that the rock could stay in one piece. And as that erosion occurred, the weight on the rock was lifted and these sheets could develop. And, and again, there had to be a huge amount of material on top for that exfoliation to occur. So the last little piece I wanna do here is just to quickly tell you what the gems in metamorphic rock can reveal. The, um, the, any kind of rock that has a gem in it is metamorphous. Like, um, and the gems we saw before were um, mica, garnet, storolite, and we also find tourmaline in the Wissahickon. But these gems actually tell us something about the heat and pressure that was involved. And here, this silvery mica is the, the kind that's very predominant. It can form at a low grade temperature of 200, about 200 or maybe 150. And it stops forming at a little over 600. If for a garnet to form, we know that garnet needed a close to 600 degrees because the scale goes from 200 to 800. The garnet needed close to maybe 500 or so, and it stopped forming garnet a little bit below 800. Storolite is an index mineral and it takes a higher temperature to form, but it actually stops forming at a lower temperature than, than, than garnet. So let's take a look at some of these. That's, this is mica schist uh, and it forms between 150 and 600. Garnet forms between 400 and 700. That tells us something about what happened to the rock that had it in it. Storolite needed to be a little higher, 500 to 600. And for nice to form, you need something in excess of 500 degrees Celsius, that is. So we know that from this nice, there was a high level of metamorphism. And then there's a kind of rock. This is a rock that's very close to Devil's Pool um, and it's called micmatite. And it almost melted down back into magma. And so it was close to 800 degrees. Um, and it kind of looks like batter that's all kind of mixed together. Uh, with rusty parts and grayer parts and a lot of lichen on it. This is also micmatite with a beautiful chlorite vein in it. And in the sun that sometimes sparkled bright green, but it's highly layered and it would be micmatite nice, very highly uh, metamorphic, again, quite close to devil's pool. So this is, um, uh, we, now that we've kind of done the Vulcan mind meld <laughs> for rocks, uh, when next time you rock pet, go walking past any large rock or exposure, I encourage you to take a good look for tilting, folding, layering. And if you can get close enough for gems like mica garment, tourmaline is actually black and long. And because they're gonna tell us the history of that rock and they have a story in them. So I'll end this. Um, actually, let me go back just uh, for a minute. There are on the Wissahick, Friends of the Wissahickon website, if you wanted to take a field trip for yourself, there are uh, two, maybe three field trips that are described. Um, it's a, a, web, a, a website that's just recently been put together and it's called Virtual Valley 
on the Friends of the Wissahickon website, and it takes you on a, a one of three trips that would go down the east side of the creek from Valley Green up towards the McGargie Dam. There's another one that's very good for people who want easy footing that goes from Bells Mills Road up to Northwestern Avenue. And then there's a third one we put up that goes um, from Valley Green down on the east side of the creek towards Devil's Pool. And uh, the pictures for that have been taken, retaken by a younger colleague of mine. And we just updated that last summer. So um, I'll end this with a quote that I love because I think that Wissahickon really is a treasure. And the quote is from the Native Americans. And it says, we do not inherit the land from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. So I think that's a nice thought to end with. Sarah, thank you. That was All so right. wonderful. Thank you so much. You're getting a lot of comments in chat. Um, people, awesome. people wish you were their geology teacher back in the day, as, as do I. Uh, and they all want to go on a walk with you. <laughs> um, let me stop sharing this and then we can see each other. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so here we are. Okay. So it's it's 8.05. If anybody has a couple of questions, we'd be happy to take a couple of questions. If you need to go, I would certainly understand. So look, before anybody does, let me thank Sarah. Um, and also next week, we're doing the Philadelphia Strategic Plan for Trees. But any questions in chat? Cindy will never look at her stone house the same way again. Yeah. Okay, no. and I just like to say some people might have a comment to make too. Because yes, I, please. Uh, some of you may know a good bit about geology or more than I do. And uh, it would be nice to have you contribute to this. Now, lots of our houses are made from the schist. Lots of Philadelphia houses are made from the schist, mm -hmm. more so than the other stones, right? Yeah, and, and from NICE, G-N-E-I-S-S. -S. Right. Uh, they came from a quarry very close to Rittenhouse Town. Ah, wait, but the whole, this is so much of the Delaware Valley is made from the same gray rock. Yeah, but Wissahickon schist is really quite unique. Right. Its layering is different from other kinds of schist. And it has, I think, a higher proportion of mica in it. Right, right, right. Um, we have a question of where you went to school. Oh, goodness. <laughs> um, <laughs> I went to a college in Massachusetts, Mount Holyoke College. And then I do have a master of arts and teaching degree that I got from Yale University. Right. But I didn't study geology there. I did biology and, I, and the geology came later. Um, I had a chance to go on a field trip through Chestnut Hill College in the Wissahickon with some professional geologists and I was with some friends and they talked so fast and said they had such a big vocabulary that we couldn't understand them. And we thought we got to translate this to, and so the three of us started to study geology. And I just want to caution you, if you go on a geology trip with one geologist, you are going to know exactly what you're looking at. If you go with two geologists or even more, <laughs> you will come back totally confused. <laughs> That's fair. Um, there's a question from Michael. He was wondering if the rocks on the, the rocks on the surface get pushed up or did, was the overlying rock eroded to reveal them? The overlying rock, there was probably 10 miles of it in the Wissahickon, got eroded over 250 million years. Yeah. And um, right outside the fault line, which is where the Wissahickon formation adhered to North America. The rock is very different. You actually find sedimentary rock, uh, sand and, and mud derived sedimentary rock on top and, and with fossils in it. Right. And so you cross that fault line and we get something totally different. That's the roots of a really mountainous land mass that got eroded away on top. Right. And the fault line is where the Wissahickon comes in and makes that big turn. Right? Yep. And a little piece of it goes right through uh, the Wissahickon, right where that, the right where there's a curve, the water coming in from, from Chestnut Hill College makes almost a 90 degree curve. Mm -hmm. It hits a different kind of rock. It can get through. So it changed direction. One of our participants has collected some lovely specimens of index minerals. Would you like any more for your collection? Oh, no, he, he or she should keep them and make, uh, <laughs> yeah, and take pictures of them and show them to us. There we go. 
Is tourmaline worth looking for regarding gem yes. quality? Um, no, it's not gem quality. It's black in the Wissahickon, and it looks needle shaped. Uh, very, and and some of it is in. It looks like it's in rods, but it's a tri. If you look at it in a cross section, it's triangular. And Wissahickon tourmaline is shiny black, and the very smallest crystals look like little tiny needles or pins, even right. smaller than that but not gem quality. Sonia is a, uh, a science teacher who's taking her class out tomorrow to the Wazek and she feels not prepared. But very good. <laughs> Anne says before this, she wanted to be an astronaut. Now she wants to be a geologist. <laughs> oh, great, great. <laughs> Lots she of thank go yous. To Mars, go to Mars and do geology there. Oh my God, that would, wouldn't that be great? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So lots of thanks from everybody. Um, including me. So thank you, Sarah. This is so wonderful. Really appreciate oh. your time. Well, you're welcome. I enjoy sharing it with folks. Good.